Good afternoon, ladies, and a couple of guys. <laughs> like my old friend from the fair, um, Edgar. Uh, we worked together for a number of years. I, for those of you that don't know, I worked for four different uh, gu gubernatorial administrations uh, running the fair in Del Mar and the racetrack. And it was a wonderful, wonderful series of people we work with, like this guy over here. So it's nice to see an old friend. Thank you. So what I'm going to cover today, I've got a lot of ground. I brought a lot of information. I'll try to be as clear as I can, and I'll try and save as much time as possible for questions. Uh, I assume there will be a lot, and so we'll try and make enough time for that at the end. Uh, here's what I'm going to cover today. It's basically six topics. First, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the primaries because they're so important and we're in the middle of the most important primary season, maybe in our lifetimes. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about Hillary Clinton's email situation. There's a lot of news you may not know about, and I'm going to make a big prediction at the end of that part. We're going to talk about Muslim immigration into Europe and what's happening in the United States, because you really need to know this. Fourth, we're going to talk about Iran, and I'll spend the most amount of time on that. That's sort of my area of expertise, and I work with members of Congress to make sure that they know what's going on, and I talk to both sides because it is important for people to really know what the deal is that our country has been obligated to follow. I'm going to spend a few minutes on Apple versus the feds and the constitutional issue that's being debated right now in federal court. And then I'm going to wrap it up and tell you a little bit about American Truth Project, which is what I'm doing now, which is my uh, venture to educate good, involved Americans like you people and hopefully a lot more in the coming days. So let's start first on the primary. I see your uh, board over there and the handicapping. Uh, let me give you the delegate, uh, up, the delegate update as of last night after uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, Donald Trump is at 382. Uh, Ted Cruz is at 300. Marco Rubio, who took everything in Puerto Rico, including all the prisoner votes, at 151. <laughs> And John Kasich is bringing up the rear at 37. I know it's crazy, but in Puerto Rico, all the felons get to vote, which I find very bizarre. In the coming days, there are two big primaries that will determine uh, probably who ends up continuing. There's the Ohio primary with John Kasich as uh, putting all of his eggs on that basket. And there's Florida uh, next week where uh, if Marco doesn't run, it's pretty well over for him. Um, my feeling is that the only reason Kasich is left in the race at this point is he's running for vice president. And Marco is um, betting on a very, very long shot at this point. Uh, I can't see him as a vice president just because of the animosity that's been created in the last couple of weeks uh, as the GOP started playing in the mud. What I'm most concerned about is who the GOP is going to have as the front runner and the anchor on the ticket against the Democratic Party. There's absolutely no question in anybody's mind that knows what's going on. Bernie Sanders will never, ever, ever be the standard bearer, no matter what happens to Hillary. So the national polls that are important right now are the three leading uh, candidates on the Republican side versus Hillary, and these numbers may shock you. Ted Cruz against Hillary wins in every single poll except for one, but not by a lot. Marco Rubio wins in every single poll by a lot against Hillary. And Donald Trump loses in every single poll against Hillary. I'm not telling you who I'm for, I'm just giving information. Now, there's a couple of things that I think will affect that as we move forward. Number one, if Hillary is the standard bearer, what the status is on her legal case. Number two, whether Donald Trump becomes presidential-ish rather than Trump-ish. Everybody knows, and I think everybody is a little bit on the embarrassed side for the GOP having watched the debates, uh, it has descended into sixth grade behavior, except all of us with children and grandchildren would never let our family members behave like that, nor would the school administrators <laughs> if that's how the kids behaved at a school debate for middle school. If that changes, 
and Trump behaves like he did in the press conference a couple days ago, everything will be different. It depends on his advisors, it depends on who the vice president is, and it depends on Hillary's situation. So let's talk about Hillary's email. It is such a big, monstrous legal problem, I'm astounded the mainstream press isn't beating this like a drum every day. About the only place you can find out about it is Fox News or on the internet if you do your work or if you talk to people that are involved. Let me explain the background, you should know this. Every single person at state has to sign a very lengthy disclosure document, it's an NDA, that says they will never disclose anything that has a classification on it they agree in writing to civil and criminal penalties if they violate it. All players at state, no matter what their status, if they violate that document, whether or not the documents are classified at that time, are liable, civilly and criminally. And here's the most important thing I want you to walk away with. It doesn't matter if it's classified at the time that they received the document. They are deemed to have known it should have been. And why is that? Because they are the most informed people that protect our national secrets. And if somebody slips up and sends them something, or if a caption is left off, they are still deemed to be under the same control mechanism. So all of these speeches that Hillary Clinton has made saying they weren't classified when she got them, right now that number is somewhere over 2,200, doesn't apply. It's how many have been classified afterwards, which right now there are the following classifications, which is secret, top secret, and above top secret, which is known as SAP, or Special Access Program Intelligence, which was explained to me again the other night. I had a very um, interesting long dinner with an admiral who said everybody at fleet above a certain um, rank, I think it's captain and above, signs this document. And he gets, he used to get SAP all the time that was delivered, read, and then taken back. It has to do with mission sensitive documents only and there are, they think, 22 of those in her email. Every one is a felony to be in possession of that information. Now, here's where it gets really weird. There's speculation that at least four countries have accessed that server that sat in the closet of an apartment in Colorado unprotected connected to the internet. Now think about this. The government gets hacked all the time. Look what happened at a major studio getting hacked behind a secure server. This was an unprotected, unclassified, non-encrypted server in somebody's two-bedroom apartment where he ran it for her. Supposedly China, Russia, and North Korea have seen some of those emails. Now, Everyone knows the story about General Petraeus, one of our most decorated military leaders. Uh, he was found guilty of uh, violations, uh, I think it was eight or nine emails. His career was destroyed. He was humiliated in public. She has several thousand, and she was Secretary of State, not a general in the Army. Independent investigators are now involved, including an inspector general that said he couldn't read many of the emails that were on her server because he only had top secret clearance. Think about that. The top cop for the Justice Department can't even read these emails. And they were in a closet in Colorado. Brian Magliano, anyone know that name yet? You will hear a lot about him. He was her State Department employee who set this up, and he was just granted immunity from prosecution. And why is that? An, an inspection system or a prosecutor only gives immunity if they want the person above that person. He refused to testify before Congress. He took the Fifth Amendment on a number of occasions before a Senate subcommittee basically saying, 
I'm not going to talk about it because I will not incriminate myself. Under the Fifth Amendment, in our, under our Constitution, you don't have to do that. So they knew he knew it was wrong, and now they went to him with immunity, and they're asking him to say what he knows about his boss. And everyone knows who his boss was, right? Everybody I've talked to, and this is a lot of people say, an indictment is being prepared right now. A request for indictment, I'm sorry, there's a difference. The FBI is our federal police force. They go to what is the equivalent of the district attorney to ask for indictment. The district attorney is the attorney general. Here's a problem. That person is a political appointee working directly for her very good friend, the President of the United States. And speculation is rampant that she will be told to shelve it at least past the election. Or until after she is confirmed as president, that's the plan, and then she gets pardoned. So, here's my prediction on this story. Numerous sources in the FBI have leaked. If she is not indicted, they will leak the details of the request for indictment, and it will blow this campaign up. Whether she's indicted or it's leaked, my prediction is she will not make it past the convention. The Democratic Party will draft someone to replace her, and I predict, as I'm hearing mumbling from the crowd, it'll be Joe Biden. Because there's nobody else. There is nobody else. And then things will get interesting. Okay, let's talk about Muslim immigration and what's going on in Europe. This is really, really bad news. And somebody call me? No? The worst situation in Europe right now is going on in Sweden. Uh, Swedish police have dealt with 5,000 incidents of criminal activity by migrants in the last three months. They've been called out to 600 assaults, four rapes, two bomb threats, 450 fights, 194 violent threats, 58 fires started as of last month. What you may not know about is the ISIS handbook. Have you heard about this? Several thousand immigrants into Europe, I don't call them refugees for a very specific reason, have been found to be carrying a booklet in Arabic, written by ISIS, giving them their commands for what to do when they get into Western Europe. I don't call them refugees because under the UN, a refugee is someone fleeing immediate harm. By the time they leave the boundaries of Syria, they are not in any harm. They could be going to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, the UAE, Turkey, etc. They're going to Western Europe because they're being offered the moon and they're being told that's part of their mission orders. There are thousands of these booklets that have been found. And let me tell you what they say. You can look this up online. Pam Geller's got it on her website. I was on... Um, Lisa Benson's radio show a couple weeks ago, and she's got it on her website as well. It talks about how you should not look like a Muslim. You should pretend to be Christian. You should have your meetings in nightclubs where they are full of loud music and drunk people. It is the perfect place to discuss terror plans without being recorded or snooped upon, and you will receive your orders once you are integrated into those societies. Are you getting this? Those same people are coming here. Those same booklets have been found in Texas at the border being left when they're being picked up by immigration. They're here now. Two of them in San Bernardino killed a lot of people. And if they hadn't been blundered upon by the highway patrol, they would have killed a whole lot of people more. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Apple in a minute. Uh, the Sweden, Swedish Social Democratic Foreign Minister declared that the refugee flow into her country which has a population of 9.8 million, is so enorm enormous, she said, quote, we cannot maintain our system where perhaps 190,000 people will arrive this year. In the long run, our system here will collapse. You wanna know how many people, 190,000 people is to Sweden? It's as if six and a half million people came into the United States this year, or just slightly over the population of Indiana. 
and they're coming in every year into about six countries. Here's a shocker for you, and I can get you this article. I got it this morning. The largest church in Sweden, the bishop in charge of that church, has recommended that all churches along the coastline of Sweden take crosses down off the buildings. And the reason she, she the bishop is a lady, said that the crosses should not be on our buildings so that people coming into our country from other countries do not feel uncomfortable. In addition, she has recommended, this is craziness, that all of those churches should have a place in them for people that want to pray to Mecca within the church. Contact me, I'll get you the article. It came out yesterday. So why do these people want to go to Sweden, Germany, and other northern European countries? It's because they're getting a whole lot of free Bernie Sanders-like stuff. They don't have to work, and they get food, clothing, shelter, education, and they don't have to assimilate. So they're creating countries within a country or neighborhoods within a neighborhood. There are certain places, for example, in France where the police will not go under any circumstance unless they take a, a battalion of armed soldiers in with them first. Firemen will not respond in certain neighborhoods because they're shot at and the trucks are firebombed. That's Europe. Go there and you can see it for yourself. I've talked to people that have come back. I assume you've heard about the thousands of sex assaults that took place on New Year's Eve in Cologne, Germany. Do you know what the German mayor's response was, Henrietta Rocker? She has issued a booklet to German women telling them how they should dress so as not to inflame Muslims to cause those Muslims to rape them. It's been released in Germany. Look it up. So in other words, the Germans are being told to act more appropriate for an Islamic state-run, Sharia law-dominated society. There were mass protests in the streets, and the people that were hit with the water cannons were the Germans protesting against what had happened to their women. The Oslo professor of anthropology in Norway says the high incidence of Muslims raping Norwegian women is because Norwegian women are not taking responsibility for their provocative dress in public. Norwegian women, she says, must realize we live in a multicultural society and we are the ones that need to adapt to it. So what's happening to these people that are being picked up? How are they being prosecuted? Um, there was just a trial concluded in Sweden uh, about a month ago, a 15-year-old year girl, 15 year old girl was raped by six boys. Five of the boys were sentenced to 100 hours of community service. And the six that did most of the most graphic acts got slightly more than 100 hours of community service and then released. There's a story of uh, Majed, a 17-year-old immigrant. He stabbed his sister Maria to death 107 times with a, a scissor and two knives because she left her forced marriage in Iraq. Contrary to the murder laws in Sweden, he was sentenced to four years. The Islamic Mufti in Copenhagen, Denmark, sparked, sparked an outcry in Denmark saying, Women who refuse to wear headscarves are, quote, asking for rape. And he said, it's not as though raping a girl here is the same as raping an Arab girl. So what's happening in the United States? Uh, I spoke before the state um, Republican Federation of Women uh, in Pomona last month, and Everyone that approached me out in the parking lot wanted to talk about what's going on in their neighborhoods in San Bernardino, where whole neighborhoods are being taken over right now, and these are the refugees, quote unquote, that President Obama has sent to California uh, without any permission and without any vote by any of you, and that's where the two murderers were living, and 
would have mowed down about triple the amount of people that they actually ended up killing, not, but not for a surreptitious uh, interdiction by the police there. Um, almost every American governor that's been consulted on this has gone to Washington and said no, and they're being overridden by executive order. And once these people are here, it's going to be really, really tough to send them back. And I think it should be part of the political process, and I think the next President of the United States is going to have a whole lot to say about it. Just as an oversight, um, the Democratic Party is going to have an acceptance platform supposedly in their um, creation of their political agenda at the convention that will say they get to stay because they're part of the American fabric. And as President Obama said, they've been contributing to American society since the founding of America. I would recommend for those of you that don't know, go back and read Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson kept a Koran in his office. And the reason he did is because the first war America ever fought was against Muslim pirates called the Barbary Pirates. They were Muslim. And if you ever want to know where the um, Marine hymn comes from, it's a reenactment of the first victory of the United States at sea by the U.S. Navy over those pirates in Libya. The shores of Tripoli, that was against the Muslims. And that was our first war away from America. And it's still going on. As far as contributions, there weren't any. You really need to read what Jefferson said. He said, I'm going to paraphrase, something like, if they follow their book, they'll never be Americans because they don't believe in what we believe in. They must walk away from those beliefs to be part of the fabric of this new society. And they're being taught the opposite. For all of you that haven't done it, I want to give you a homework assignment. Please buy a Koran and read it in a good English translation, and you will understand so much more. And the next person that tells you it's a religion of peace, you can call them a liar and you can give them the citations. Please do that, because it's, it's a lie that's been foistered by both parties on the unsuspecting, ignorant American population. Let's talk about Iran. How many of you know that Iranian agents hijacked a dam a year and a half ago in New York that controls the water supply for most of upstate New York? Anybody know? Did you hear my last speech? Or you already knew this? Okay. Um, it wasn't reported in the press. Had they done what they were planning to do, several million people would have had a polluted water supply and would have had no access to clean water for weeks. They could have blown up three dams and literally destroyed the reservoirs in this entire water system. The Wall Street Journal blew the story up about a month ago. It was never in the press. Well, let's talk about the JCPOA. JCPOA stands for the Joint um, JCPOA. I'm forgetting the C. Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Sorry. This is the deal done by Secretary Kerry, with his president's blessing, over the protest of the United States Congress and 68% of the American public. Who knows who it's a deal between? Anybody? Mm -mm. No. It's not a treaty. It's not an agreement. It's never been signed. We signed it. They didn't. So based on the fact that our president signed it, and it was confirmed at the UN, we gave them $150 billion, and they have signed nothing. Why? Because the Ayatollah said he's never going to sign it. And that was confirmed by their parliament uh, the following month. This goes back about three months ago. So let's just assume there's sort of a gentleman's agreement, which is all it is, if you can call it that, in quotes. What's happened since then? Have they come into the 21st century, as President Obama said they would, and have they changed their behavior? No, this is what they've done since then. They fired a, one, maybe two, nuclear-capable ballistic missiles on October 10th. The UN went crazy. Why? Because they violated a number of UN agreements, including the JCPOA, that says they cannot do long-range ballistic missile testing because the purpose of a long-range ballistic missile is to develop and send weapons over continents. 
right? It's not a local missile. They already have missiles that can hit Israel and the entire Middle East. These are missiles that can now hit Western Europe and North America. The Security Council condemned it, and then the sanctions they applied were nothing. A UN report came out a month ago that said they've had a very active nuclear weapons program dating back two decades. In every single public proclamation by Iran, they have denied it and said they never had a nuclear weapons program. The UN has now confirmed that they've been actively developing nuclear weapons for 18 years. The IAEA director presented the IAEA members with the what's called PMDs, possible military dimensions of that program that showed they've been doing it, that they violated the non-proliferation treaty, they've been accused of developing nuclear weapons, and what was their penalty for that? Nothing. Nothing. My sources in the Middle East say that they've probably already received nuclear triggering devices from Pakistan who sells them to anybody with cash. And Iran has more cash available than any country in the world that is uncommitted right now. Iran has already violated several major tenets of the JCPOA that they never signed. They've missed every single deadline. There were nine conditions that Iran said they would add to the JCPOA. And unless those conditions were approved by the United States, they would not follow the JCPOA, and we have agreed to none of them. So as of right now, there is no agreement, orally, in writing, anywhere. The next person that says the Iran nuclear deal, tell them there is not an Iran nuclear deal. There's a series of things we said we would do, and we signed it, and there's some things that they said they would do orally, None of it's in writing. Khomeini, the uh, Ayatollah who runs the country, said all sanctions must be off. If any sanctions come back, no deal. He said every single sanction that's threatened in the future is a violation, would be no deal. Um, they do not have to ship the advanced enriched uranium out of the Arak reactor. It was all supposed to be in Russia. We don't know where it is. We can't find it. Uh, they will renovate and change the purpose of the uh, Iraq reactor only after they sign an alternative plan, which was never signed. And on and on and on. I'm, I could go through all the nine conditions. It'll take me about 45 minutes. So what they do with the $150 billion so far? They made the largest buy of advanced Chinese fighter jets in history of the world. Those are the jets that were probably uh, engineered based on stolen plans from General Dynamics, and they are very, very good jets, and Iran's paying cash. They have bought the new Russian missile system. They just entered into very large negotiations with Airbus for the largest single long-range passenger jet purchase in history. And they have announced in Tehran that they are shipping large sums of money to Hezbollah and Hamas to continue the fight of jihad. To make matters worse, for those of you that don't know, because it really wasn't in the press here, they announced in Tehran that every single Palestinian that dies attempting to kill an Israeli gets $7,000. And when Israel convicts them, either when they're still alive or post-mortem, and bulldozes their house, wherever it might be, that family gets $30,000, and that money's already being transferred every day. So the money that we had is now being paid to people to kill Israelis. And these are people we made a deal with. Here's a wild one. This happened just yesterday. Israel went and met with Putin to say that the new Russian missile systems are being transferred out of Syria, I'm sorry, out of Iran into Syria and given to Hezbollah, who Russia is very worried about because Hezbollah said they're going to go to fight in Russia too. 
So the Russian missile system, the S-300, is being stopped from being transferred as of yesterday just because Russia got upset that Iran is breaking their deal on the Russian missile system by... Meanwhile, the uh, SA-22 anti-missile system is already there and being shipped and being built right now. Here's really wild stuff, and I, for the life of me, I can't figure this out, it just burns me. Kerry went before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee 10 days ago and pleaded with them, your U.S. Senators, not to sanction Iran. And the, and the list of violations is this long, of things that Iran has done since the deal was signed, including the transfer of money into the West Bank to kill Israelis. And he pleaded with them not to sanction Iran further. What the heck is that man thinking? And who's he really working for? You know, I won't tell you who I met with, but I met with a very prominent ranking Democratic congressman a few weeks ago, and I asked him that same question after I told him this. He said, yeah, I'm familiar with it. I said, why is Kerry behaving like this? And he said, you know what we think? And I said, who's we? He said, the Democratic caucus. I said, you're going to tell me a story from the Democratic caucus about your Secretary of State, because he's not my Secretary of State. He said, yeah, Kerry is running really, really hard for the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and he's, he's going to be nominated, and he thinks he's going to get it, and he's afraid if this deal breaks down, he won't get it, and that's the legacy he really wants, since he never made it to the White House. That's my inside scoop on that. Let's talk about Apple versus the feds for a minute. This is a really interesting thing, and, and I think it has great constitutional implications. Everybody knows about what happened, right? Um, the Apple iPhone that the terrorists had, they stepped on it and broke it right before they were killed. And apparently there's 18 minutes of um, unaccessible data as to who was giving them instructions. They're part of a terror cell. They didn't just read about it in a magazine and decide to become terrorists. They had, an, they had people they were reporting to that were supplying them with plans and agendas and other people to work with. So the federal government went to the owner of that phone, which is the community center where the guy worked, and they said, yeah, absolutely. Hack the phone. Take it all. That's our phone. So I said, thank you very much. But they couldn't because it was broken. So they went to Apple and Apple said no. And the reason Apple said no is because they feel that their competitive advantage in the marketplace is all about being able to have a, an encrypted phone. So the government is asking for an extension of the New York law, which was a 77 Supreme Court case about expanding technology oversight by the government. This is way beyond what the government or the Supreme Court envisioned in the 1977 case, which had to do with regular telephones. And so it's probably going to end up at the Supreme Court. The allegation by Apple is it won't just be one hack. Once they have the back door, they'll have the back door permanently. They're also saying it'll apply to all other devices. They're also saying it's a dangerous precedent. And the heart of our democracy is secrecy and, and privacy, and this will destroy all of that. Let me give you my response. And I've had a discussion with several congressmen about this, and it kind of goes both ways. I think what could happen, and this seems to be true, is Apple could put their engineers in a room and break this phone. And the FBI could be sitting right over there. And they can say, come over here. Here are the 18 minutes of messages. Copy them down and now leave. And never give up the code. And I think with a court order, that should be acceptable. I have an iPhone. I'm OK with that. Anybody else? Because we don't know who these people reported to. And with that information, maybe we could. Okay, let me tell you just a minute about ATP and then we can do questions, is that good? Okay, so as I say to every group I speak before, I don't take a fee, if one's offered.
Uh, what I would ask you to do is support a project that I've put together, which is a tax-exempt organization called American Truth Project. And the intent of that is the creation of videos and promotion of television shows that I do and writings of people that are trying to get the story out there through every social media and other accessible point that we can because, as I was telling these peop nice people at our table here, there's just so much you don't know and you can't get it through traditional sources. And we've got sources all over the world to talk to us because they want the truth out. So my producer Sutton will have a sign-up sheet that hopefully she can run around with and put your names on a list and we'll send you mailings and we'll send you stuff that we're doing and if you want to help, you can help and we'd appreciate it, okay? So thank you.